Teresa, thanks immensely for doing this. Maybe you could just start by asking the question, where does regeneration fit in Maori culture, in, in Maori values? O tuatahi, John, he mihi nui ki a koe, um, uh, ko wai au, he uri tēnei nō te taitokarau, i te tātoku pāpa nō Ngāti Kauke Whangaroa, i te tātoku māma nō Hokiaka, Hokianga Hakapau Karakia, uh, ko Teresa Tepne Ashton tōku ingoa. Uh, so I'm just introducing myself and my language as is appropriate for me from an Indigenous perspective, letting you know that I help in the far north of New Zealand, um, lucky enough to belong to both coasts, both on the east coast with my father and on, my, on the west coast for, with my mother. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, re really, really proud of my lineage, uh, proud of where I come from. And really, really, you, you talked about being Māori. I, I could never be so proud than ever before to be Māori today, uh, because I think that we are bringing, you know, really wise discussions to the world, wise um, perspectives in relation to our own heritage, which really connects us, if you look at our, um, our creation story, connects us to the land, um, you know, in a very um, family-oriented way. Mm. And uh, there's no way of separating, separating us. So when you bring that into an environment of today, uh, you know, that sort of relationship with your, with your sky father, with your... Uh, um, land and mother, mother earth, mm. um, there can only be but better solutions to the problems that we face today. And to what extent has that cultural take on existence been um, diluted or in some cases wiped out by colonisation? I mean, you know, if we want to get really political, there's always the doctrine of discovery, which really was part of eliminating us as a people, not only Māori, but all Indigenous peoples. And so the harm that that has done, and at times continued to happen throughout the world, has really been devastating on all of us. What I do know, though, is that it's time for Indigenous people to come back to the fore, to bring wisdom to the conversations, to bring a holistic um, thought piece to the well-being of us as people, our uh, well-being of the land and the environment that we live in. I love that. Uh, but I, I, one, one sort of sidebar note there would be when I hear wisdom, I hear something that is gentle and, and, and um, engaging. And when I think about the history of the Maori people, I also think about that one of the very few Indigenous peoples that fought the British Army to a standstill, invented trench warfare and so on. So at the heart of this is also a fairly robust uh, character, I suspect, and I, I hope that still exists, at least in some measure. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that we we hold dear to the force of our ancestors, mm. you know, and really the fight that they fought. Um, and as much as it's a different fight today, it's still there. But yeah. I think the thing that we that that's we're always carrying as any Indigenous person is the um, are the values and the um, principles on which we operate on a daily basis yeah. they're very clear they're very simple they are innate in all of us and they are things like nurturing you know manakitanga um, mm. like um, kaitiakitanga to to really ensure that our environment is well um, and and the sense of aroha that we come at this from a sense of, of peace and love when we last spoke, I mentioned that a matter of pride to me is that um, part of my family tree embraces at least one Maori woman. Your response to that was, yes, that was all part of colonization. And I think my having read about her character, she was extraordinarily independently minded and uh, forceful. So uh, anyway, the, the, these worlds have entwined. Now, you, you, you came from a family that was not a banking uh, family, not a business family, perhaps even, and yet you moved into that space and very successfully. But 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 in headlines, how did that happen? I understand your father played a big role in that. So I was very fortunate because the things that the the main component of my parents, particularly my father, was that he knew how to dream. He hadn't forgotten how to dream, yeah. and so having um, earned his living in the bush, being a bushman. 
he brought that back into the cities and his yearning to be able to continue that trade. And he started his own tree doctoring business. And this is in the early 60s, which was mm. extremely unusual, unusual for a Māori man to um, own a business, let alone operate it successfully. And, um, and with that, he put into his, he bought into his business his own tikanga uh, or his protocols, his principles um, that guide us as Māori. And so yeah. for him, it wasn't just about the money. It was about ensuring that his family were fed, ensuring that other extended family were involved in the business. He'd teach them about, um, you know, being independent, to, to rise above whatever the issues were that they were facing on a daily basis. What I saw actually happen in our family is that we were all involved at our dinner yeah. table. It was about what was going to happen in the business the next day. And so it was, it was an extension of who we were and our language changed. Mm. Um, but also our appreciation of, um, of, of money came as well. So yeah. that we, you know, my dad, my, my dad was very, very good at managing his money and, and really pulled those sorts of competencies onto us as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where I got my steadfastness in relation to, you know, being very careful on how to man manage money to ensure that um, we were not slaves of it, of it but yeah. we were guiding our future, basically. And so once you'd got your early mastery of money and you were sort of able to ride this buck bucking bronco, you went out into the mainstream and uh, oh, into cool. a big bank. So how did that happen? So I started at the bottom. Um, I think I was a, uh, they called it a service assistant, which is a, a key word for um, PA, uh, to, to, to the second in charge of the bank. But my inquisitivity really, really overtook everything that I did. And so slowly but surely, I started investigating all avenues of the bank. And then I uh, was able to decide areas that I wanted to move into. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, the, the, one of the great opportunities was being trained in different aspects of banking. And this is corporate banking, not yes. retail banking. Yeah. And so I was lucky enough to choose um, transactional banking um, from a, and pioneering the electronic for form of tra transactional banking, which is mm. electronic, electronic banking today. The part of that really that I enjoyed the most was mm -hmm. working alongside corporates because it's all about building relationships, mm. you know, and Māori like to build relationships, not oh. for the case of doing business, but for the case of getting to know the person. So why didn't you stay with that uh, world? I mean, you obviously mastered that one too. Right? What, why did you yeah. move out now? Well, well, by then I became a mum. <laughs> yeah, that changes things just a little. And so I realised that, yes, I loved what I was doing, but my values didn't always fit. Mm. And, um, you know, banking can be a very competitive environment. Yeah. And, um, and so I decided that it would be better for me to be closer to my children Mm -hmm. At that stage, I was traveling a lot, um, and it didn't really suit me. I mean, I, I have an amazing husband who became the stay-home dad, but but really, when I think about it, it's probably one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made in life, because I missed out on being with my children yeah. every day yeah. from the time they were born. Yeah. I was the part-time mum, yeah. and when I think back, as much as it was great for the advancement of our family... And it probably destroyed one part of my soul. Your family and community, how did they view that period of your life? Do they think you'd been ab abducted by aliens or what was their reaction? Or were they proud about the fact that you'd moved into a different universe? Yeah, I, I remember the first time we I got to travel overseas and I had my whole tribe arrive at the airport <laughs> to, out, to farewell me because there was a sense of pride that I was... Yeah going beyond the family unit, which is a large unit, by the way. Yes. Um, but that I was seeking further, you know, I was, I was the adventurer. 
And yeah. so immense pride from that. I, I do know that they did not understand my going off leaving children. Um, yeah. That was no, no. Um, and at the time, you know, I, I got very selfish and wanted to have a career for myself. Um, and that's fine. But, you know, eventually I woke up to the fact that actually I just want to be a stay home mum for a little while. Yeah. And so when I had my third child, that's exactly what I did. However, I soon realized as well that I like challenges. My mind has to keep going. And so now I've realized that I can have the best of both worlds yeah. and have an amazing career and still balance it enough to have an amazing family life as well. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and, and, and trying to bridge between the financial world and, and, and your culture. So I'm the um, with Māori Women's Development, and we help Māori women and their families to start and expand businesses. We do have a loan fund. Mm. Um, however, we have very affordable interest rates at um, 3% against about 12 to 15% wow. uh, business interest rates average here in New Zealand. So it's about affordability. It's about equi equitable access to money for our women because Māori women and Pacifica women actually are least likely to be funded for business yeah. or for enterprise, um, both startups or expansions here in New Zealand. And I suspect most places in the world. Um, and so uh, we have actually been around for 34 years now. And uh, where I started about 10 years ago and it was then that I realized that our focus was primarily on, on the funding but I've now changed it so that 80% of what we do is actually around pastoral care. We've developed um, training programs. Uh, we've developed um, support networks like we actually have life coaches. So we've embedded life coaching as a foundation within, as a framework within our organization. We also have uh, business mentors with and dis with different disciplines of business within within business, whether that's HR, marketing, retail, tourism, etc. Mm. And then we have specialist advisors, our accountants, our lawyers, and all of that support network is free. How do, how do you sort of assess progress? For us, it's the well-being. It, it's the client that's that measures success. It's not mm. us. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, we want them to be successful businesswomen, but we want to be them to be whole and resourceful. And um, and the reason why we call we also include family is because Māori women are always inclusive of, of their family. Yeah. And so when we meet with our woman, we want to meet the family. We want to meet, uh, see the environment in which they operate. We want them to be successful, but that's up to them. What how how success is measured. But you will find that every Māori business woman, let alone every Māori person, will be involved in their business utilising Māori ways of practice, Māori philosophies, yeah. uh, Māori principles. So it's a different way of building a business, really. You've just been, come back from Dubai. Uh, you've been involved in Indigenous diplomacy, to some degree, I suppose, uh, 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 Indigenous politics. Say a little bit more about that. It was extremely successful. Well, Good. number one, we were there to support our own expo, mm. um, you know, and, and the um, agencies who are driving that and the EBI that's driving that as well. But more importantly, our, our event was about Indigenous to Indigenous. And, you know, and, and so there were so many pearls of wisdom that came through that we were all on the same wavelength because we've all experienced the same level of, of colonization. Yeah. It's just that some were further behind and more impacted than maybe us, or we were behind in other things. But we're all taking, we're all speaking the same language as people who've been affected by colonization. And so as a result of participating in that, there are many collaborations that will continue to occur, um, not to mention also our, our Emirati comrades, uh, you know, um, but we also got to meet 
and mingle with, you know, and in fact, it was probably a surprise to me that the Emirati have very, very similar um, values to us. The way in which they yeah. operate. Yeah. We, are, we really are all come from the same level of um, understanding around our environment. When I think about my ancestors and the amazing um, triumphs that they had to, to create such a beautiful people, um, then I feel very, very happy. In fact, I get quite emotional. Oh, well, I mean, the Maori came right the way across the Pacific, didn't they? They had extraordinary navigational skills. And I'm sure that you and hopefully people like you will help us all navigate our way into this uh, extraordinary yes, future of ours. But... In fact, we took a navigator with us, Hotsuroa oh. and, um, and he went to meet the people of the sand who, who also navigate with, with through, with, through the stars on the sand. So whether it's water or sand, uh, navigating is, um, you know, it occurs the same way. I, I, I would love to have seen that. But um, Teresa, thanks immensely for making the time. Um, I, I, I will watch you from a safe distance. It's a great comfort, even though you're on the other side of the planet, to know that you're doing what you're doing. And, and thanks for sharing some of that with us today. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate it.